Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening from Belize to wherever you are joining us this morning. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the seventh edition of the Belize September Lecture. I am Rolanda Kokom and I will be your host this morning. I am from the Institute for Social and Cultural Research of the National Institute of Culture and History. We have an exciting lineup of speakers and presenters today. I am very thrilled to see so much persons in attendance. We have 47 persons on the Zoom platform and we have about, let me just see, another 50 persons on the live stream on Facebook. And I am aware that this is being also broadcasted on, broadcasted on the other main um, media channels. And so we are happy that everyone is able to join us today. If you have any questions and concerns and issues that may arise, please let us know in the chat and we will have someone look into that. To get started, we will have the chair of the Belize History Association, Dr. Abigail Maquie, give us welcoming remarks. Dr. Maquie. Yes. Good morning. It is my pleasure as chair of the board of the Belize History Association to welcome you to this year's lecture entitled Belizeanizing History, Decolonizing and Independent Belize. This year's lecture is in keeping with a time in our lives when we are taking stock of our realities. Let me use this opportunity to introduce you to the other community members of the 2020-2022 Governing Board of the Belize History Association. The Vice Chair is Ms. Ruby Reyes. Mr. Fran Smith and Ms. Ifashina Efunyeme are senior members. Ms. Carla Pinello and Ms. Jaylene Logan are junior members. The Institute for Social and Cultural Research, ISCR, is our secretariat with Mr. Rolando Kokom as our liaison. Other ex officio representation on the History Association Board comes from the University of Belize, the Belize Archives and Records Service, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and the Ministry of Education. For the past seven years, the Belize History Association has proudly presented the National September Lecture in collaboration with our Secretariat and the National Celebrations Committee. Each year, we attempt to share a little of our Belizean history as presented in research findings. This year's lecture topic explores decolonization and highlights its relationship with independence. We welcome your participation in today's event and all other BHA events. Every Belizean is a member of the association. You become engaged members by signing up. I urge all my Belizean sisters and brothers to become engaged. Together, we shall Belizeanize our history, overcome adversity, create opportunities, and unite for a prosperous future. Stay COVID-19 safe. Welcome to our lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Abigail Maquia, for those kind words of welcome to all of our audience joining us from across Belize and across the world. Today, as you mentioned, is an important day for us to reflect, to dissect our history, and to be able to imagine a better future for all of us. With that said, I'd like to invite our Second speaker, Mr. Nigel Incalada, Director of the Institute for Social and Cultural Research of the National Institute of Culture and History. Mr. Nigel. Uh, thank you, Rolando. Good morning, everybody. Um, I want to begin by saying good morning to the Chair of the Belize History Association, Dr. Abigail McKay, the Executive Members of the BHA, 
Uh, and good morning to our presenters, Ifashina Ifunyemi, Jordan Craig, Delmar Zib, uh, and Dr. Filiberto Penales. I also want to thank uh, Dr. René Villanueva for agreeing to moderate this, this session. Dr. Villanueva, um, we certainly appreciate you taking the time to do that. We know that you have been a strong advocate for the teaching of Belizean history and the Belizeanizing of our school curriculum. Uh, fortunately, over the last few years, the Ministry of Education, in partnership with um, its other partners, including which, have undertaken to, to introduce what is called Belizean Studies, um, which is, uh, of course, now all students at secondary school will be required to undertake uh, four years of the study of Belize's history, culture, and society. So. Uh, I use this opportunity to thank the Ministry of Education for recognizing this important need uh, in this developing nation. When the BHA was formed a few years ago, it was founded with the intention of reviving efforts to explore and examine Belize's history. It was designed to build on the work of earlier efforts by institutions such as SPARE, the Society for the Promotion of Education and Research, and groups such as the Belize Historical Society, among others. There are many there are very many Belizeans who individually and collectively had also pursued this goal. And I wouldn't want to attempt to name all of them, but we thank you for the work and the effort that you have undertaken in the past. And we ask for your continued engagement, since we are now engaged, involved with a younger generation uh, involved in the study, as is manifested today in the panel that is, being, that is going to participate in the lecture. The efforts in the past, that helped to bring forward aspects of Belizean history and social life into public view for education and nation building purposes. The BHA is still a young institution and is currently working to build the interest and capacity of its members to fairly and objectively undertake the study and continued examination of Belize's history. This includes the research and presentation of papers and the conduct of lectures on historical events, people, and ideas. It is also and more importantly, it also and more importantly includes the preparation of a comprehensive history of Belize. By a comprehensive history, it is the intention that any future history of Belize that is written must tell the story of all of Belize's people and including our roots and routes or from where we came so that we may be able to chart in a deliberate way our future course filled with aspirational ideas, justice and action. I want to thank the four presenters and moderators for undertaking this important exercise in this our seventh annual September lecture. May you provide fresh perspective and inspire others to reflect on and to take action for the process that is the decolonization of an independent Belize. Thank all of you and uh, I ask that you look forward to participating, look forward to hearing and participating in the lecture. I want to thank the media houses who have agreed to broadcast this lecture today. Enjoy the lecture, everybody. Thank you, Mr. Nigel Incolada, Director of the Institute for Social and Cultural Research of the National Institute of Culture and History for those valuable words and that intervention. I'm glad to report that our audience is extremely diverse. Um, today we are being joined from communities across Belize and from communities across the world. Thank you for letting us know from where you're tuning in. Please tag someone who would get value from this national lecture. Share the link with friends and family. And we hope that you will enjoy the presentation by our upcoming panelists. Today's lecture is being moderated by someone who needs no introduction, Dr. Rene Villanueva. He is a familiar and unique voice to known throughout the country and in the diaspora. Among his many roles and accomplishments, he is currently the Chief Executive Officer of RSB Limited and the Honorary Council of the Republic of Peru in Belize. It is my honor to invite Dr. René Villanueva to moderate today's session. Good morning and it's a pleasure for me to um, serve in this capacity as a moderator for this very historic occasion. Let me start off by greeting all those who are tuned in um, in Belize and around the, the world. It's an honor and a privilege to have you 
tune into such an important um, lecture as the one that we'll be doing um, today. When it comes to, to, to history, I am an ardent, as you know, advocate for the teaching of our history in our schools, in our six forms, in our junior colleges and in our universities. Because I believe that if you don't know your past, it is difficult for you to appreciate and understand your present. And of course, if you cannot understand your present, then it is always difficult to plan for your future. So history is extremely important. History is um, described in, in, in the dictionary as a study of past events, particularly of human affairs in one instance. It's also um, said a continuous, typically chronological record of important or public events. Well, I would take a simple example of driving as, as, as history, as you, you, you move forward, of moving forward, you, you, you have your future in front of you. Yes, you know where you're going and you have your eyes set on where you're going. But if you don't count on your past experiences, if you don't look in that rear view mirror every now and then, then you are prone to make mistakes, right? So our history, we should learn from our history. Having said that, um, I, I reflect, you know, there are many thoughts that go through my mind and, and I, know, I don't want to take up all the time here. Uh, but one of these thoughts um, that, that is one that was uh, brought out by the father of the nation, the right Honorable George Feist, when he spoke way back in 1969, I think it was to a teacher's conference. And he said, um, to a child, his world begin at his feet, not in some far distant land. Why are we teaching our children about the Nile River and not the Belize River? You know, history lessons begin at home, begin in the familiar surroundings of the child, and then moves on outward um, to, to, to the rest of the world. So let me congratulate the Belize Historical Society and say con um, what a good job you're doing in highlighting our history and in decolonizing, because that's the only form we can, we can decolonize Belize is to understand our past. If we don't understand our past, like I said, we cannot appreciate our present and we cannot plan towards our future. Let me say a present good morning to the panelists. Uh, we have a distinguished panel made up of Ifasina Efunaimi, and she'll be speaking on the relevance of decolonization. Jordan Craig will be speaking on the internationalization as decolonization with the practice of independence and beyond. Delmar Zib will be speaking on why decolonize education. And Filiberto Penados will be speaking on decolonization and indigenous peoples. So without any much ado, let me introduce our first panelist, Ifashina Efunaimi. Ifashina Efunaimi is a Belizean writer, educator, journalist, and advocate. She was among the founding members of the Belize History Association's executive board on which she currently serves as a senior member. She has been involved in several small projects, including being the co-author of the book, A Walk Through the Culture Capital, Dangriga. Since commencing her teaching career in 2008 at the Stan Creek Ecumenical Junior College in Dangriga, she has taught various Belizean and Caribbean history and research methods courses. In addition to teaching, she remains involved in several organizations, including the National Garifuna Council and the Productive Organization for Women in Action, POA. In 2019, she received the Woman of the Year Award for the Stan Creek District and was also awarded the United Nations Religion Fellowship by Outright Action International. It is my honor to introduce to you Ifashina Efunaimi. Go ahead, Ifashina. Not hearing her. which means greetings everyone to everyone listening. I invoke my ancestors, Nagubrigu, Wayunagu, the Ahari, and the ancestors of all those whose stories remain untold since the destroyers, the colonizers, unleashed their racist and destructive campaign against all people of color throughout the world. It is my pleasure, my passion, and my purpose to speak with you today as part of this year's National September Lecture with the theme, Belizeanizing History, 
decolonizing and independent Belize. My contribution today will focus primarily on the definition and relevance of decolonization as the catalyst of what should be a most thought-provoking, analytical and informative discussion. May this and all the presentations today plant or water seeds of liberated, decolonized thinking and eventually action so we as a nation will sooner rather than later enjoy true independence. Until the lions tell their, their side of the story, the tale of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. This quote is listed as a Zimbabwean proverb or other times simply as an African proverb. Chinoa Achebe, renowned African author, also has a version that says, until the lions have their own historians, the history of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. It is appropriate to begin my presentation with this quote because as we think of and discuss decolonization, we must recognize the role that writing, particularly the writing of history, our story has impacted our current state of affairs. John Henry Clark describes it best in The Black Scholar in 1975. He says, European writers have distorted African and world history in order to create a rationale for the slave trade, the colonial system, and the institutionalization of racism that followed. He goes on to then describe how even though civilization did not begin in Europe and the peoples of the world did not sit around in darkness waiting for Europeans, white people, to bring them light and civilization, the books written on world history glorify Europeans to the detriment of all other peoples of the world. The hunter's story, you see, has been reigning supreme. In order for us to understand decolonization, we must first understand what colonization entailed. During the age of imperialism, we're talking about from after Columbus got lost in 1492, and then the arrival of not just the Spaniards, but then the, the British, the French, the Dutch in this hemisphere. European nations sought to expand their empires in this hemisphere through invasion, through uh, colonization, through settlement, through exploitation. It mattered not if these places were already occupied for thousands of years prior to their arrival they were only interested in increasing their wealth and their power, their domination. To achieve this, they imposed themselves on the people and places they invaded. They forced their religion, their language, their food, their names, their rules, their infrastructure, their system of governance, their clothes, and the list goes on. They forced all of these on the people they met in the places they invaded and eventually colonized. They imposed everything. Nothing was done voluntarily. This was all forced. As Jennifer Mohammed describes it, colonization was based on the idea that the civilization and culture of the colonizer was superior to that of the colonized. The colonizer was concerned with the supremacy of its own culture in civilizing people and lands won through emp empire building. Now, imagine people had already been civilized long ago, thousands of years as a matter of fact. People had already achieved advanced civilization. Yet, 1492, when Columbus got lost and when the Spaniards and all the others came, they came with the mindset that they were coming to civilize people who had already long been civilized. So you see when these European nations invaded other nations, they came with the clear intention to take over in every way possible, body, mind, resources, everything. Such was their strategy of deliberate psychological conditioning that they not only pushed their culture as superior, but convinced the colonized to accept that imposition as truth, as right, 
as bitter and to see their own culture as false, as wrong, as inferior. Europeans used terms like savage, heathen, barbaric, and uncivilized to describe the people whose lands they invaded. Now to decolonization. David McIntyre, author of British Decolonization 1946 to 1997, defines it as the withdrawal from its former colonies of a colonial power, the acquisition of political and economic independence by such colonies. He further refers to Leopold Senghor's definition of the term as the abolition of all prejudice, of all superiority complex, and in the mind of the colonizer, and also all inferiority complex in the mind of the colonized. Let me say that again. The abolition of all prejudice, of all superiority complex in the mind of the colonizer, and also all inferiority complex in the mind of the colonized. So, essentially, to be decolonized, the country has to be completely independent, economically, has to be able to sustain itself, politically, has to be able to govern itself, make decisions for itself. And when you consider Senghor's view, the country has to think for itself, be ideologically independent free of the impositions of the colonizer. In most, if not all Caribbean nations, the process of decolonization, yes, the process, because it is not a one shot, snap of the finger kind of thing. The process began with some form of resistance and there's been resistance from the very beginning, from the first encounters, there's been consistent resistance. The labor and trade union movements of the 30s and 40s were major mobilizers for change. Workers, the common people, came together to fight for their rights. And it was on that high energy and powerful spirit of solidarity that nationalist movements were built. In Belize, there is no exception here. It was the labor movement first all that energy, the impetus made by workers, the common people, that then the educated elite capitalized on to start nation building, to start the movement toward independence. They capitalized on the momentum that had been built by workers who were standing up against the colonial structure, against the merchants, the capitalists, structure that was oppressing them. People wanted the change that would cause their lives, the quality of their lives to improve. In order to achieve independence then, nationalists sought to depart from the colonial rule that had been imposed for centuries. As we consider this process in Belize's context, the question we must now ask is to what extent have we truly departed from colonial rule and all that was imposed on us by the British? The relevance of this consideration, this analysis is to assess our independence at 39 and moving forward as still young nation, a very young nation, we must look at what it is that was forced on us, what it is that we inherited as we gained our independence, so-called independence, on paper, yes, independent. What have we released? What have we let go? What have we kept? What are we still holding on to? In closing, I draw from Audre Lorde, who said, for the master's tools will never dismantle 
the master's house. They may allow us temporarily to beat him at his own game, but they will never enable us to bring about genuine change. And I want to reiterate that. For the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. They may allow us temporarily to beat him at his own game, but they will never enable us to bring about genuine change. It is at this crossroad that we are as a nation. How much of the master's tools are we still holding on to and using? How much of it is creating division among us so much so that we cannot build our own selves as a nation to say this is, this is what we stand for. And everybody that was brought here or that was already here, we are now a part of this nation, all of us making our contribution to what is known as Belize. But as we even look at neocolonialism, as we look at the modern colonization that is now bombarding us, we still have to continue to resist resist from those impositions, from those foreign agendas that are being pushed. And the very people saying a foreign agenda is being pushed are also pushing a foreign agenda. We need to look at all the contributions that we, we the root Belizeans have made to create this nation. What is reflected in the laws that we have? What is reflected in the democracy that we say we practice? How much of the values that we impart and continue to teach in our schools, in our homes, on our streets, how much of it is truly ours do we know? That is the question we must ask ourselves and seek to answer if we are truly going to be free and if we're truly going to be decolonized. Our minds must be liberated. Today's discussion calls on us as a nation, a people still building a nation in all our diversity to determine what truly defines us, what is truly our ideology, what is truly our story, not his story. May we truly decolonize and step into true independence, even in the face of neocolonialism. Thanks for listening. Ceremony. Um, thank you so much, Ifasina. That was very, very wonderful. That was a wonderful presentation, Ifasina, and uh, definitely thought provoking. Um, it led to what I continuously describe as the need for a revolution of the mind in our country. Because our slavery, yes, we have had our political independence, but have we truly attained our mental independence? And I think that that is the question here, you know? And so thank you for putting it in such a, a wonderful way. And um, I, I liked how you described the European writers, the starting history, the colonization, the imposition by force, the civilization, um, teaching us that one nation is superior to another, um, that like when you say Columbus get lost too, because of the Wekechi, you know, he actually get lost. I, 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 I'm one of the advocates in all honesty that would say, let's just stop celebrating Columbus Day. I think we have stopped doing that, you know, um, because he, he really got lost. And, and, and getting lost um, changed um, everything. Um, but all, all of this lead to, like I said, I, uh, the question that you asked, are we truly independent? Are we truly independent? Are we still holding on to some of the colonial trappings in our minds that prevent us from moving forward united as one people, putting our country above all that is in front of us, all, 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 all adversity? Now let me move on to our second um, presenter. And our second presenter here is um, Jordan Craig. Jordan Craig presently works within the policy section of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Belize. She was part of the National Public Awareness Campaign, the lead up to the referendum on whether Belize should submit Guatemala's territorial claim to the ICJ. Since 2017, 
Jordan has been a member of the Belizean Studies Working Group and supports the development of the Sovereignty Unit of the Belizean Degree in Development Studies from the London, sorry, the Development Working Group and supports the development of the Sovereignty Unit of the Belizean Studies High School Curriculum. He has a Master's Degree in Development Studies from the London School of Economics and a Bachelor's Degree in International Relations and History from the University of the West Indies in Mona, um, Jamaica. So, ladies and gentlemen, Jordan Craig and her presentation. Jordan, good morning. Hi, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today. I will share my screen now with my presentation. Hi, yes, hoping everyone can see my screen. So uh, my presentation today is titled Internationalization as Decolonization Praxis, Independence and Beyond. And I have two objectives today. The first is to address internationalization as Belize's strategy to achieve independence. And the second objective, um, I would be remiss not to address the uh, how to what extent internationalization has remained as a strategy for Belize's ongoing decolonization. Internationalization, as we are well aware, was our strategy to achieve the political independence of Belize, but to what extent has it continued to be a strategy for us in our decolonization? So I'll address those two objectives. So first, Belize's march to independence. This is a story we know very well. It began in the 1950s, with the formally in the 1950s, as Ifesina pointed out. The movement in the 1950s, the nationalist movement, has its origins in the labor movement of the 1930s, but formally began in the 1950s, but was blocked by Guatemala's threat to use force to satisfy its territorial claim. As such, Britain was convinced that the best way for Belize to secure its independence was to negotiate a settlement with Guatemala, but proposed settlements that emerged from those talks between Britain and Guatemala, as well as mediation that was done by the United States in the late 60s, the results of those talks were always at the expense of the sovereignty or territory of Belize. And that is something Belize would never accept. And so this is the, the local context of which our March to Independence began. But there's a relevant global context as well. Decolonization was peaking in the 1960s and 70s. And the United Nations and non-aligned movement were at the apex of their influence. The non-aligned movement, of course, was the international movement of countries which had emerged from the national liberation movements and decolonization processes that were occurring in Africa, in Asia, and in Latin America during the post-war period, starting knowingly with India in 1947, and Pakistan. And so at this time, they were at the, the apex of their influence in the international arena. And so the process of decolonization was slowly and steadily becoming addressed in international law and in international norms. And two concepts, key concepts that were emerging from this period were, or being formalized in this period were self-determination and territorial integrity which were formally addressed in the 1960 UN Declaration on the Granting of Independence to Colonial Countries and Peoples. So the very fact that this was emerging, these two concepts were emerging in the international arena, and the fact that the United Nations and the non-aligned movement were at the apex of their influence, as well as the results of the negotiations that were occurring between Britain and Guatemala, that pushed Belize to adopt the internationalization strategy for independence. So I take this definition here from Asad Schumann's book, Belize's Independence and Decolonization in Latin America. And he writes that this strategy of internationalization was conceived by Belizeans to achieve Belize's independence with all its territory intact as well as adequate security against a Guatemalan invasion. This strategy 
was conceived and implemented by Belizeans who were non-state actors to counter Britain's legal standing as the administrating power, as well as the aggressive stances of the United States and Guatemala, whom were all state actors. So it's Belize in the international arena as a non-state actor seeking to increase its power and its standing and leverage it against some of the most powerful state actors at that time. The United States was one of the superpowers at that time and it still is the superpower. And the United Kingdom was the previous superpower of the world. And Guatemala was, the regional, was a regional power at that point. So this was Belize's strategy to elevate and balance out the playing cards by internationalizing its fight for independence. And how did it do so? It did so by appealing to the international norms and the moral authority of international organizations. As I said before, the United Nations was at its apex, was at its apex of influence at that time. And self-determination and territorial integrity were emerging as solid cardinal principles of international law. So this was the global circumstances were so conducive for Belizeans and Belizeans took the action and responded to the moment with this brilliant strategy of internationalization. And so internationalization had several methods. The major two methods, as I have here at the bottom of my slide, were one, coalition building, and two, negotiations. There were other methods as, um, for example, the Belizeans lobbied non-governmental actors in other countries, such as journalists, such as NGOs, um, academics, largely in Central America and the Caribbean. But though that was a secondary method, the major methods were with state actors, coalition building and negotiations. So the first strategy, I mean, sorry, the first method of this strategy, coalition building. The objective of this method was, as I said before, to gain Belize, a non-state actor, leverage in negotiations with the UK, with Guatemala, and the United States. The United States was always hovering in the background of these negotiations as the regional power in the Americas. And so this method entailed the Belizeans steadily lobbying, mostly of governments and international organizations, to incrementally build a network of support for Belize. So how did they start this? The first, the first target of the coalition building method was CARICOM. CARICOM, the Caribbean community, because of the strong historical and cultural ties shared between the CARICOM states and Belize. And this strong cultural and historical ties made them very natural allies. And CARICOM was very quick to jump in support of Belize, largely as well because many of them had already achieved independence and many of them were in the process of decolonizing themselves. So CARICOM made very strong statements in support of Belize at various international organizations, such as the Commonwealth, the OAS, the Non-Aligned Movement, and the United Nations General Assembly. They raised the issue of Belize wherever they could. And I, I'd like to point out the very key role of CARICOM in this enti entire internationalization process was the fact that they drafted the UN General Assembly resolutions whose language were pro-Belize. So at the UN, all the drafts that came out in, in favor of Belize were known as the Caribbean resolutions because they were drafted by the bigger countries working with Belize, Jamaica, Barbados, Guyana. So that CARICOM played a very instrumental role, an indispensable role in our coalition building method. The second actor that we approached was the Commonwealth. And the Commonwealth, as you may know, is composed of former colonies of the British Empire, as well as the United Kingdom. And the Commonwealth held significance for the UK, a very special significance for the UK because it was used as a tool of maintaining 
British international prestige as its empire ended, right? So the Commonwealth was used to bolster pro-British sentiment and pro-British values worldwide, even as its empire was ending. And so because of this very special significance that the Commonwealth had for the United Kingdom, the Belizeans were able to use it very effectively in naming and shaming Britain into honoring its obligations towards Belize, including a defense guarantee. And the main conduit of this naming and shaming done by the Commonwealth was the Commonwealth Ministerial Committee on Belize, which included the independent Caribbean countries, as well as larger Commonwealth states like Jamaica, I mean, like India and Tanzania and Malaysia. So uh, from beyond from the Commonwealth, then the Belizeans moved to the non-aligned movement. And as I said before, the non-aligned movement represented the majority of the world that was emerging from the decolonization process, as well as national liberation movements. And the non-aligned movement was key because firstly, they represented two thirds of the United Nations membership, as well as having just coherence in fighting for hard won principles. They were very motivated to firstly defend the hard won principles of self determination and territorial integrity, having just emerged from their own decolonization processes. And they were quick to defend and strongly defend colonial territories. So this meant that when Belize went to the non aligned movement, the interpretation of self-determination and territorial integrity privileged Belize as a colonial territory over that of Guatemala. They didn't accept Guatemala's interpretation of those principles, largely because of their bias towards colonial territories like Belize. And then, of course, there are other blocks at the UN. You may see some of my icons down there. You had the African states which the Caribbean countries were key on lobbying for us on our behalf. Um, you had the socialist bloc, which Cuba, which was the only Latin American country at that, at, in the earliest stages of our internationalization campaign, was the only Latin American country to support us. So Cuba was instrumental in acquiring the support of the socialist bloc at that time, the USSR and the other Eastern European states. So apart from those, the last large block that needed to be tackled was Latin America. And Latin America was the hardest block to gain support for Belize from because of their solidarity with Guatemala. They share deep historical and cultural linkages like we do with CARICOM. And so very naturally, they sided with Guatemala at the very early stages of our internationalization campaign. But the first dent in Guatemala's hold over Latin America was Panama. And it was in the support of Omar Torrijos, who in 1976 sided with Belize. And Panama could very, very sincerely sympathize with Belize because of what it was dealing with with the Canal and the United States. And so other than Panama, the next fracture of Guatemala's support in Latin America was Mexico who was instrumental in quelling the aggressive stances of Guatemala and the United States. And then from Panama and Mexico, it tackled with Nicaragua and eventually chip by chip, country by country, Belize chipped away at Guatemala's support in the region. And so what was the result of this? The result was six pro-Belize UN General, General Assembly resolutions starting in 1975 to 1980. And these resolutions really limited the scope of action that could be taken by the United Kingdom, by Guatemala, and by the United States in negotiations with them, because it, it, it left Guatemala nothing to, to negotiate. The UN resolutions affirm the right of Belize to self-determination. It affirmed the right of Belize to independence. It affirmed the right of Belize to territorial integrity, meaning that if Belize became independent, it had to happen with all its territory intact. And those resolutions affirmed that Belize must 
take part in the process of close consultations with Guatemala and the United Kingdom to remove all barriers to Belize's independence. And in 1980, the UN resolution added one strengthening factor. So every year from 1975 to 1980, the resolutions in favor of Belize became steadily stronger and stronger and stronger. And in 1980, the UN general resolution um, called for the independence of Belize in 1981. So you can see here how this method of the strategy really bolstered the position and the leverage of Belize in negotiations by basically securing the support of the world. So the second method of internationalization was the negotiations. And of course, the objective of the negotiations was to gain Belize's independence with all its territory intact and a defense guarantee from the United Kingdom. Um, given all the context that I have given you that was in favor of Belize, such as the apex of the UN and the apex of the non-aligned movement, there was another global context factor that was in support of Belize. It was that the UK prioritized disengaging from its colonies. It really wanted to get out of Belize while maintaining its international prestige and the US special relationship. But what hindered Belize and delayed independence was that it did not want to accept a defense guarantee agreement. It did not want to leave troops in Belize. Rather, it wanted to focus its defense in NATO and in Europe. But that changed in 1971 with the Thatcher administration. And of course, Belizeans took advantage of that moment with the internationalization strategy and secured independence in 1981. So the object, as you can see here as well, the UK and the USA pressured Belize to give up territory or to enter a governance arrangement with Guatemala. But with the leverage that Belize had gained from coalition building, Belize was, effectively, was able to effectively counter this position of territorial cession or the giving up of sovereignty to Guatemala because it had the support of the world. And so it constrained the United Kingdom to fulfilling the obligations of those UN resolutions. And you will see here that I say talks with Guatemala were not important. And why do I say that? It's because Guatemala, that Guatemala would not accept any settlement that would leave Belize entirely independent with all its territory intact. So the real part of this method of strategy of negotiations was with the United Kingdom to secure its independence and to secure it with a defense guarantee. And of course, the United States was hovering in the background, but talks with Guatemala were very ceremonial Belizeans just sat there at the tables and were not going to accept anything that Guatemala said. So it was all for show. So the real talks were with the United Kingdom for that defense guarantee. And we know the result. The result was independence with all our territory intact and a defense guarantee from the United Kingdom. And I say there, in fulfillment of the UNGA resolutions. So because of coalition building, the result of negotiations was that our independence was determined by the UN resolutions and not by the United Kingdom, not by the United States, and certainly not by Guatemala. So as I, I, as I got through that enormous amount of history, I ask you to bear with me for two more slides in which I discuss internationalization as a strategy for Belize's ongoing decolonization. And I think that this is a very interesting thing to talk about because I, I don't really think it's been touched on. Um, what has internationalization done for us to continue that decolonization? And I, I argue that it's been a mixed record. The positive side is that our active participation in international organizations has continued and many of the organizations that we are a part of directly challenge Western dominance and elevate and help address our evolving security and developmental issues. So our membership in CARICOM, our membership in the Commonwealth, 
in the Alliance of Small Island States, in the, o the Organization for African, Caribbean, and Pacific States. These are organizations that, one, challenge Western dominance and Western thinking, and elevate those very unique issues that affect Belize, such as climate change, sustainable development, economic shocks and vulnerabilities. And of course, um, the fact that we have seized Guatemala's claim and taken it to the ICJ is another example of our active participation in the international arena in which Belize seeks to appeal to the international norms and international legal principles to solve its security issues us taking our, the claim of Guatemala to the ICJ is just another demonstration of our independence. Our independence as sovereign as a sovereign state, rather than a passive, dependent actor, which most powerful countries would prefer us to be. Um, in relation to other decolonization efforts, Belize has not been as active as I, I personally feel it should be, as we are all aware that there are still colonies around the world that are subjected to foreign rule. But one highlight of our work in this area has been the Chagos case, which Belize participated in between 2017 and 2018. The Chagos case, and I encourage Belizeans to read on it because it says it can inform a lot to you about our own case at the ICJ. The Chagos Archipelago was divided by the British from the country of Mauritius in the 1970s, just as Mauritius was about to gain independence. And the Chagos case now, according to the ICJ, Britain violated international law by cutting Mauritius, the territory of Mauritius, and keeping the Chagos Islands. And so there again is a demonstration of the legal principles that have underpinned our independence and our decolonization process. The principle of territorial integrity, where you, a colonial power could just not slice away territory and keep some for itself and some for its use. The Chagos case reaffirms that. And so Belize's participation in that case was a very good action by Belize um, as furthering decolonization around the world and in our own minds. But I, I have to say that there is also a negative side. Um, internationalization has involved us cozying up to the United States and to the United Kingdom. And this has diminished the freedom we have had in making our own decisions, whether it be political, whether it be economic, whether it be foreign policy, what our institutions look like. Our relationship with the United States and Britain have diminished our freedom in making those choices. And there are, there are several examples. Um, the fact that I come from foreign affairs, um, the decisions as of late made by CARICOM over the election of Almagro in the OAS, as well as Claver Caron in the IDB, are just examples of US and British influence dividing CARICOM and diminishing our freedom to make choices that perhaps were in our favor or making us make decisions that are not necessarily in our favor. And of course, there's the other example of the Commonwealth being divided right now by the white dominions of the Commonwealth, namely Canada, New Zealand, Australia, and the United Kingdom. So it is these Western influences that are still trying to undermine our, our participation as sovereign states in the international arena. And of course, the fact that we have the Westminster model, the fact that we had to cozy up to Britain to keep the soldiers here post-independence, left us with very little freedom in determining what our political institutions would look like. We are left with a very flawed political system and a government system a winner-takes-all electoral system that has limited the participation of the people to a 10-second action every five years of voting and has left us with a prime ministerial dictatorship in which the one office of the prime minister 
determines the entire composition of the executive branch, determ determines the composition of half of the legislative branch, determines the composition of the judiciary with the appointments to the Supreme Court and other courts, as well as the British monarch. What does that say about our independence to have a foreign head of state? And I'm sure many of you have seen the news yesterday in which Barbados declared that they are finished with colonialism and will have a Barbadian head of state by November of 2022, 2021, sorry, next year. So the, the example of Barbados serves to ask ourselves, we should be asking ourselves, to what extent have we decolonized? To what extent have we decolonized 39 years into our independence? And without further ado, I leave you with one quote from the Jamaican intellectual Norman Gervin. So maybe to help provoke thoughts on this last question that I have asked, to what extent have we decolonized? Norman Gervin wrote in 2015 that above all, sovereignty is the capacity of a society and its citizens to think for themselves. Thank you very much for having me for this presentation and I look forward to interacting with you a little bit later. Okay, I want to thank you so much, Jordan, for that wonderful presentation. I am, you really took me down memory lane with regards to the internationalization process because I was very familiar with that internationalization um, process um, as, as, as it took place. I'm very familiar with the articles that you, that you refer to, and I think we should be teaching and looking seriously at those, um, at the resolution 3520, I think it is, of the 11th of November 1980 of the United Nations that led to the, the independence of Belize, that paved the way for the independence of Belize, that, that really called for negotiations to take place between Britain and Guatemala, that led to the eventually to the heads of agreement over which we, 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 we were so divided. And um, we learned later on that the heads of agreement were just maybe heads of, that we will need to seek agreement on, you know? And, 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 but we need to study this thing carefully and you have done a very wonderful job in bringing this, uh, all this home. I, li I like how you ended though. Um, you, you, you said, um, to what extent have we um, decolonized? You know, to what extent have we decolonized? And that's a very searching question because we can have our political independence. We can have, even maybe, we don't even have our economic independence yet, but we can also have our economic independence. Let's say we attain that. But until we attain our mental independence, where we think for ourselves, where we do things for ourselves, where we, as one nation, right, unite and put our best forward for our country, then we will always remain with the colonial toppings left in the residues of our minds. So, yeah. It leads again to what I always say is a revolution of the mind that is needed to really put Belize first and everything else uh, behind, right? And, and, and the unity and, and of the Belizean people. So one, one wonderful presentation, thoroughly enjoyed that. And thanks for, thanks for putting things in, in, in perspective. Like I said, I, very, I remember that process very well, that internationalization process. And let me call three names here with your permission. Um, Asad Schumann, right, Bobby Leslie, and um, Shirley Harvey. Those were the three people that were sent to the United Nations by, by then Prime Minister, uh, Premier George Price to internationalize the Belize question. I think only, uh, I'm told that only, um, only Asad Schumann knew where the building was. And they did such a wonderful job in internationalizing the Belizean um, question that we eventually got our independence in 1980 when the United States and most of the nations in the world decided to vote in favor of, of it. Right? And, and, and so guaranteed that 39 years later, we are still here because that resolution also calls on the United Kingdom to continue guaranteeing the independence of Belize. Let me introduce our next um, presenter. And our next presenter is um, Delmer Zib. And Delmar Zib is an educator at St. John's College High School in Belize City, Belize, since 2013. 
He has continually worked in the process of decolonizing history in the education system. He participated in the development of St. John's College's history curriculum and also contributed towards the current Belizean Studies framework for high schools. Mr. Zib possesses a bachelor's degree in history from the University of Belize, a postgraduate diploma in history from the University of the South Pacific, a diploma in education methodology from the University of Belize, and a master's degree from the University of South Pacific. Mr. Zib has worked on four publications, The Black Cross Nurses' Rights, The 1919 Revolution, E-Consciousness, and Maximo, The Last Alcalde of San Jose Yalbac. The publications focus on stories that have been marginalized from the general narratives of Belizean history. A proud native of San Antonio Cayo, a Maya community, Mr. Zib is also an advocate for community activities that promote the Maya culture, tradition, and language. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Delmar Zib. Hi, good morning. Um, this morning I'm going to be presenting on why we should decolonize the education system. Um, let me just share my screen. And while I do that, uh, I also must recognize that the process towards um, decolonizing the education system has started. Um, but let me just start by stating that I am going to be talking about education, not only as a for or in the formal setting, but also in the informal setting. In the Emancipation Jubilee Lecture organized by the Library of African and Indigenous Studies and the Image Factory, Andofi Io, a well-respected historian and academic in Belize, argued that the current education system inherited from England cannot lead Belizeans to free their mind, that is, decolonize. Io's call for questioning and critical analysis merits further consideration. His ideas inspired a series of questions that I aim to answer today. Is your mind free? Why is freeing your mind important? How do we free the mind? These questions carry deep implications to understand and deconstruct colonialism, remove the fears of colonialism's long-lasting impact, and find hope in freedom. We often hear people recite the lyrics, emancipate yourself from mental slavery, none but ourselves can free our minds. But what does Bob Marley mean? Marley's empowering line calls for the development of consciousness and a challenge to the unfree cognizance. He prescribed a questioning of knowledge, power, and education. On the other hand, Marley suggests that the minds are jailed within colonialism and its impact. In his critique of colonialism, Césaire Aimé, a French poet and post-colonial scholar, argued that colonialism denotes a physical and ideological uh, domination. Cognizant of this reality, Marley calls for decolonized thoughts through the questioning and critical engagement with hundreds of years of colonial domination, acculturation, and assimilation. He pleads for consciousness raising and the educational arena is an important space to continue the process of contestation. Is your mind free? After Columbus encountered America in 1492, the European invasion and colonialist visions ushered an indigenous apocalypse. Professor Virgilio Enriquez, a Philippine scholar, provides one of the most comprehensive descriptions of the process of colonization. He suggests that colonialists deny the existence of any culture in the new territory and proceeded to remove any physical representation of indigenousness. The colonial project then created institutions such as schools, legal systems, and churches to denigrate indigenous culture. Professor Virgilio's analysis indicates that colonialism was imposed to ensure that indigenous traditions and philosophies would disappear and that Eurocentric ideas would prevail. Colonialism created a binary of oppositional forces that shaped a sense of inferiority on the colonized. According to Franz Fanon, a psychiatrist and political philosopher, the colonized has two dimensions the self-world and the world of the colonizer. For Fanon, the consciousness of the colonizer is framed within a hierarchical view of the world. Gayatra Spivak, a literary, literary theorist, offers a similar analysis. She contends that the voice of indigenous has been subjugated, disqualified, and delegitimized. Other scholars such as Edward Said and Homi Baba support this analysis. Colonialism drastically changed ways of thinking and carried out an ideological and cultural genocide. Poluki Adebisi, a senior lecturer at the University of Bristol, argues that the colonial experience reduced education to a tool of communication between the colonizer and the colonized. The goal of colonial education were to eradicate indigenous forms of teaching, stop the transmission of indigenous culture, and sever the continuity of traditions and cultural identities. As an instrument of domination, schooling naturalized the assumptions of Western superiority by having indigenous and colonized students internalize their own oppression. In his analysis of the power of indoctrination and predictive error, 
EO argued that the system of education, which he describes as miseducation, has messed up the minds of children because it denied knowledge of, of their history in good light. He stated that students have learned, internalized, and accepted lies about their ancestors. EO proposes that the system of education was and is formulated to serve the interests of dominant forces, hegemonic forces paired with colonial structures and policies, persist in marginalizing indigenous peoples and reducing education to schooling. Paulo Freire, an education theorist, described the colonial frameworks of education as a process of domestication. Freire states that domestication is socially constructed by powerful elites and their hierarchical knowledge transfer. EO suggests that education is not an objective process. Rather, he claims it has spread lies, erasure, and double consciousness. He proposes that the, that the Europeans, who handed over political power to the petite bourgeoisie, made sure that this group did not see their struggle as the same as the proletariat and rural peasants. The results of this process is limited change in the inherited educational system where reforms do not shape the foundations of colonialism. The product of this type of education is an alienated student where achieving adequacy through adopting a dominant Eurocentric culture can be understood as the major learning and developmental goal. I want to pause that alienation. I want to pause that alienation because it is at the center of teaching and learning. Students may experience, may experience alienation at two levels. One, in the dynamics of the classroom and relationship with the teacher, and two, with a disconnection with the content taught. In his analysis of English education, Surianto Surianto proposes that alienation provokes student powerlessness in the classroom since the teacher is the, whole, is the holder of power. He adds that students may suffer meaninglessness when they are unable to grasp the importance of activities or concepts. The inability to find the relation between what is taught and real life is one of the key impacts of colonialism on the alienated student. The student feels estranged. The student does not find himself or herself, but rather gets an undignified image of the self. Marie Batiste, an indigenous scholar, has critically examined the centeredness on Eurocentric knowledge in, in the education systems. Her analysis of cognitive imperialism, that is, the cognitive manipulation used to disclaim other knowledge bases and values, externalizes how education is used to deny a, a group's existence. In her investigation, Batiste outlines several examples of cognitive imperialism in the education system, including English dominant instruction erodes diversity of culture assume superiority of knowledge of people in dominant spaces, otherness presented as a cultural maladjustment, success is defined as assimilation to dominant values and norms, and indigenous knowledge has not been allowed to thrive in the formal education system. But this day's critical engagement with systems of oppression also showcased that even after colonialism, vestigial education policies continue to oppress a liberation of the mind. The rationalization of the theories led me to a series of questions. How is the education system socially and culturally shaped by the state? Does our education system consider the liberation of the mind? Does it normalize and privilege Eurocentric ideals? Does it support class and patriarchal ideals? Is there a need to change the methods and disciplines that repeat Eurocentric perspectives? There's much room for change, but how do we emancipate ourselves from mental slavery? Why is freeing your mind important? The result of the colonial system has been a groomed, domesticated, and alienated being. Fanon's psychological an analysis calls the process an inferiority complex that is cemented on economic and material subordination and centered on an internalized sense of inferiority. His examination attacks colonialism in its physical and ideological form. But since my presentation is on education, I am going to focus on the mind, consciousness, or ideology. Nora Borongo Mueke, a postdoctoral education scientist, argues that citizens' awareness, that is consciousness, entails the entire mental perception of the socioeconomic and political reality. She suggests that the individual's consciousness enables the being to evaluate and influence encountered phenomena. In her theorization, Muek identified five models of consciousness, social, moral, economic, historical, and political, that are interconnected with substructures including socialization, value justification, satisfying needs, societal change, and the legitimization of power. Mueke's analysis provides a holistic view of consciousness. On the other hand, Manuel Castells, a Spanish sociologist, argues that one form of identity formation depends on dominant social institutions that contribute to the establishment of society. 
both Mueke and Castells, offer valuable contributions to the understandings of consciousness. According to them, consciousness is indelibly influenced by society. In Belize, since the 1600s, this citizen's awareness has been framed by colonial discourses of domination. It has promoted erasure, invisibility, and double consciousness that continues to hamper our development even today. The fact is that political independence in 1981 did not give us independence of the mind, and we must start a process to deconstruct, reconstruct, and recast our sense of being. I am not talking about a total transformation to pre-colonial times, rather a critical analysis of who we are and a critical analysis of what has and continues to shape us. Decolonization entails an unmasking of the layers of socialization and identity formation enacted by colonialism on individual and society. Education as a tool of, of socialization is an important arena to promote a consciousness that contests the, the ingrained colonial ideas of the self, knowledge, and power. This necessitates a historical analysis that allows the persons to critically explore the past and its influence on the present. The process of discernment with facts of the past contrasts a dangerous and ever-threatening nostalgia for the past. Embracing a critical view allows persons to identify the arenas of conflict and break down the imbalances in society. Freire, arguably the most quoted author on decolonizing education, claims that decolonizing teaching is necessary at two levels. The first level entails the content. This level allows the students to examine the legacies of colonialism, critically analyze history, and liberate their minds from the sense of inferiority. However, the content is null if a pedagogy of freedom, thinking, and questioning is not employed. The second level entails a radical shift in the structure of the classroom and teaching. Fair states, this discovery cannot be purely intellectual and must involve action. It must include serious reflection in the process of co-intentional learning. His words articulate an empowerment of the students to think critically alongside the teacher to enact self-liberation. It moves away from the banking and test-taking systems of education to one that promotes critical thinking as, reassure, as resurgence sorry, of indigenous consciousness. Evoin Potras et al. add to Freire's contributions. For them, decolonization is a political movement that pushes back on the historical and contemporary forms of colonialism. The idea is that decolonizing education entails dialogue and respect for pluralities and diversities. Decolonization becomes an antithesis of the one-size-fits-all philosophies of education. Instead of elevating Eurocentric ideals, a decolonized education explores different knowledge systems, embraces alternatives, strengthens community orientation, and fosters collaborative and integrative approaches to teaching. The aim of, decolonization, of decolonizing education is to transform the world we live in. Our duty is to channel creativity and imagination to our students in the hopes that they will change society. Empowerment is not just teaching, teaching but rather the questioning the inherited system of the colonial enterprise. The decolonization process of thought allows us to write our own story and know how the colonizer's story has impacted our sense of being. How do we free the mind? It is important to note that, dec that decolonizing entails an analysis of the personal as well as collective, of the physical as well as spiritual, and of the psychological as well as emotional and intellectual. Although I have mentioned the ideas of Freire, Eo, Fanon, and other scholars, I believe that there is no straight answer in, the, in this diverse, relative, and multifaceted world. However, I ascribe to Eo's stern call to high quality education that allows the mind to become free and allows the body to enact change. But I also realize that this in itself may only apply to a section of society, since I refer to education as a socialization tool of liberation that is not limited to schooling. Poitras et al. suggests a potential route towards the decolonization of the education system. They argue that in the first phase, there is a need for social awareness and consciousness building. In this phase, Colonialism is taken as an arena of examination to talk back to colonial powers casting off hegemonic approaches of seeing and learning. History is, de is deconstructed, lies are debated, arenas of conflicts are exposed, and stories of local empowerment are celebrated. The second phase entails a critical anti-oppressive approach to national narratives, inequalities of societies, and the recognition and analysis of power and privilege is carried out. The third stage entails the valuing and incorporation of indigenous knowledge. In this facet, spaces are created for indigenous and alternative knowledge to have equal footing as dominant ideologies. This process of interconnecting the best of indigenous and Western views 
will enable the fourth stage, which is self-determination. This phase builds a, naturalized, builds a naturalization of the colonizing acts. Post-colonial theorists agree, agree that developing consciousness entails a difficult process that incorporates various tools of analysis. This is a potential avenue to deal with how co colonialism conducts to dominate us and to deal or create a docile, obedient, and disciplined workforce. It is not an easy task, but it requires a constant organization of critical thoughts, a constant questioning of past and present realities, and a constant reaching out to society to promote consciousness. As EO stated, slavery is a state of mind and not a physical state. Emancipation or freedom is a state of mind and not a physical state. My hope is that this presentation has answered why decolonization or why decolonizing education is important. I do not claim to have all the answers, but I am sure that through questioning, further learning takes place, deconstruction takes place, and consciousness building takes place. Though education existed within the larger colonial structure, it proved to be an important element in the domination of the masses and imposition of self-hate on the Maya, East Indians, Garinago, and the African descendants in British Honduras. The prime issue is that through the civilizing process, ourness, nativeness, Belizeanness became centered on Euro values, projecting a demeaning view of ourselves. Decolonize means question. Decolonize means be open. Decolonize means be tolerant. Decolonize means free your mind. Decolonize means nurture who you are. Decolonize means empower. Decolonize means move to action. How does a decolonized Belizeaness look like? Breed freedom into Belize. Thank you. Man. What a wonderful presentation there, Delbert. Breathe freedom into Belize. I, 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 I like that idea. What can I say? You know, breathe freedom into Belize. And we can only free, be free if we free our minds. We have attained our political independence, like I said earlier. We can, we, we, maybe, maybe if we continue working, we, we can attain our economic independence, but we need to be independent mentally because slavery happened in our mind. So is your mind free is the question that you ask. And that really is the question. Are we really free living in the land of the free? We, our national anthem says we are land of the free, but are we truly free mentally? And that, 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 that's a serious question. I, I look at the education system, which you alluded to, and I would say sometimes that God did not create any inferior Belizean. He did not create any Belizean that should fail. God created all Belizeans in his image and likeness. So why do we have a system that passes and fails people? You know, why don't we have a system where from a child, from childhood, a child is looked at and pointed in the direction he should go. It's biblical. The Bible says point a child in the direction he should go, and when he gets old, he will not depart from it. Education really comes from the Latin word, as you know, the Latin word educare. Um, and um, education means to draw it from within. Are we drawing out what is within our people? And, but in order to, to find out what is within us, we must know first and foremost who we are. And so presentations like these today are very important to establish who we are as a people, to make us think and reflect on the greatness of the Belizean people, and to make us understand that we are all one people, Belizeans. Let me introduce our next presenter, Dr. Filiberto Penados. Dr. Filiberto Penados is a Maya educator and activist scholar from Sakots Village, whose work focuses on indigenous education and future making. He has held faculty positions at the University of Belize and Galen University, and has been adjunct, adjunct faculty of the University of Toronto, University of Belize, University of Manitoba. His experience also includes working as a child development and education officer at UNICEF, serving as research director at the University of Belize, and establishing Tumulkin Center of Learning, an alternative indigenous education center. He has a long history of involvement in indigenous movements in Belize and Central America. He has taught, written, and uh, he has taught, written, and presented on topics including the decolonization of education and development. He is currently founding advisor at the Center for Engaged Learning Abroad and president of the Julian Cho Society, which is a Maya organization in Southern Belize. Ladies and gentlemen. Dr. Filiberto Penados. Pleasure, Doctor. I'm not hearing you, Doctor. There you go. Thank you for the introduction, 
and thank you for all of those wonderful presentations that gone uh, ahead of me. Uh, I thought that it was excellent um, three presentations, and so I'm, I'm left with the task of uh, tying things up and uh, kind of rising to the to the quality of the of the presentations. I'm going to share my screen, so just give me a second and. Um, Okay, so I think uh, that should be that should be working. So <clears throat> I'm going to talk a little bit about indigenous decolonization, and I think it sort of leads from the last three uh, presentations that we just uh, had. And I hope, as I said, to in some way tie together some of those uh, some of those presentations. But I want to start a little bit by recapping. A little bit, I think, of what um, Ifashina shared at the beginning, um, because I think it's really important, especially as we get to the end of these uh, set of talks. So de indigenous decolonization. I want to start by, first of all, kind of reviewing a little bit, of, uh, as I said, what do we mean by colonialism? I think it's really important to, to recap that and also to think about, about what decolonization means in order for me to talk about indigenous decolonization, ultimately, uh, what lessons one can draw from that experience uh, for decolonizing independent Belize. So as you see there in the slide, in a sense, colonialism is a political and economic relation where a sovereignty of a nation or people is in the hands of someone else. Ultimately, it's a structure of exploitation of foreign land and people. Now, often we tend to think of colonization as a historical period that started in 1492 and ended in the 1980s with the independence of St. Kitts and Nevis in 1983. However, colonialism, as you've heard from previous presentation, really was a violent rearrangement and redefinition of space, of time, of, of being, of who, our sense of self, and of intersubjective relations, the way they relate with each other, and of course, of knowledge and knowledge production. The fact is, again, as kind of my colleagues pointed out, that colonization did not end with independence. Um, colonialism gave rise to a way of thinking that people like Kihano and a number of Latin American thinkers uh, referred to as coloniality. Essentially, uh, a logic and a pattern of power that emerged with colonialism, but that persists, be persists beyond the colonial administration to define culture, labor, being, intersubjective relations, and knowledge production, right? How we understand ourselves, how we relate with each other, how we relate with the land, uh, what, we con what constitutes uh, knowledge. All of those are, in a sense, influenced by that logic and pattern of power. Kihano points two things and says, you know, this coloniality rests on two important things. One was the construction of biological difference into a hierarchy of race. Right? In such a way then that indigenous and African peoples became less compared to Europeans. At the root of this is really a doubt about the humanity of indigenous and black people. This is essentially the foundations of the relations of domination that conquest uh, instituted. It became a justification for dispossession and enslavement. In rendering the other as less than human, as not having souls, of applying this concept of anima nullius, not having a soul, uh, you know, it, it rendered people's bodies, uh, people's uh, language, people's land, people's knowledge as inferior and therefore for the taking. The second uh, element uh, on, on which uh, colonialism or coloniality rests, uh, points uh, Quijano is the subordination of labor, land, resources, and products of that uh, into a global capitalist uh, system. That is the subjugation of land and labor to, to capital and global markets. In this way, for example, indigenous lands were no longer going to be there for the production of corn. In fact, 
the production of corn. The clearing of the land was a problem uh, because it was destroying the forest where mahogany would be harvested. Never mind that mahogany was being harvested uh, from those lands uh, from way before. So the vocation of the land was no longer for the production of corn, but rather for harvesting mahogany and logwood and all of those things. Similarly, the labor of the African slave would no longer be controlled by the African person, no longer to sustain himself, his family and community, but rather to produce surplus uh, for somebody else. So then what does decolonization mean and how do we go about doing it? In a sense, decolonization has to mean overcoming the patterns of violence instituted by colonialism, overcoming the institution of a permanent doubt about the humanity of indigenous and black people. It has to do with rescuing land, rescuing labor, knowledge, intersubjective relations, and very important, the future uh, from the colonial logic. And this is what I want to talk about uh, a little bit. It is not easy to respond how does decolonization ought, uh, ought to happen. We heard from previous presentation, and I think from the experience of Belize, a number of lessons that could be drawn. For example, the importance of building coalition, the importance of decolonizing the mind. But I want to talk about indigenous uh, decolonization. Now, the struggles against colonialism by indigenous peoples and other enslaved and oppressed peoples have been constant. Uh, in, in speaking about indigenous struggles against uh, colonization, however, I will focus on the struggle of Maya people of Southern Belize, largely because I have observed this more closely and have been an active participant as a kind of activist scholar. And in doing so, I will focus on only on certain elements of that struggle. Maya decolonial uh, action has also been quite varied. I could talk about uh, Maya decolonization of education, for example, through the experience of Tumulkin, which sort of uh, critique the colonial moorings of development thinking, uh, attempted to make space for indigenous ways of knowing and doing in the curriculum by making space for knowledge, uh, indigenous knowledge bearers and indigenous knowledge, and uh, by challenging the coloniality of the hidden curriculum and fostering community ownership of education. Uh, similarly, one could talk about how the Maya Healers Association is engaged in a way uh, at creating a space for indigenous understandings of health and well-being. What does it mean to be well? What does it mean to be healthy? By trying to create a space uh, for Maya ways of understandings of health and healing. But what I want to talk about is the question of land rights, which is uh, uh, an element of the Maya struggle that I think is quite well known. And then I also want to talk about Maya efforts at articulating a dream for land and people at imagining and crafting a decolonial future. Now, as I said, the Maya land rights uh, struggle, I think, is known by a, num a lot of people, but I think I'm going to recap for the purposes of, for the purposes of uh, those people who might not be as familiar and for the purposes of making some uh, important points. So in the mid 1990s, uh, logging concessions were granted to foreign companies on lands that historically been used uh, by the Maya people and lands that they considered to be theirs. These were granted uh, without any consent of Maya people. Essentially, the Maya people woke up to find their backyards and their way of living on the land disrupted. They raised their voices against this act and obtained limited response. They filed the first case in 1996, but the case was never, never got a hearing in court as it was constantly delayed. Frustrated with this, the Maya took their case to the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. Uh, they attempted negotiations um, while that was going on with limited response. And so in 2007, they went back to court, uh, taking the case of two communities. <clears throat> Essentially, the Maya people argued that they're indigenous peoples who have a long-standing use and occupation of the land and that their pattern of being on the land constitutes a form of property that has been violated by the government by not obtaining their consent in granting these concessions. The state, on the other hand, argued that the Maya are not indigenous, that they are indigenous, but just not indigenous to Belize. They are, as they say in Creole, Dakonya. In any case, whatever rights the Maya people might have, they argued, these were extinguished 
to the colonial and independence process. In any case, the Mayas won their case. <clears throat> and now in 2007, the Mayas kind of uh, understood that the ruling would apply to all communities, uh, but the government uh, considered this to only apply to the two communities that were brought to court. And therefore, in 2010, the Maya people had to go back to court to seek a declaration that it applies to all the 39 uh, communities. Again, uh, they won their case. The government appealed. The Maya people won their case again in 2013. The government took the case to the CCJ. And again in 2015, through a court uh, order, uh, the court ruled that the Maya people have rights to their land, that their way of being on the land, their way of owning the land constitutes property, and it has been violated, and therefore it needs to be identified, demarcated, titled, and protected. Now, I provide this quick overview to point out some of the ways in which the colonial logic is alive and illustrate the decoloniality of the land rights struggle of Maya people. Firstly, that the Maya are struggling to defend or recover precisely what the colonial process dispossessed them of, land, should not be lost in its obviousness. What could be more decolonial? Secondly, it is interesting to note that the Maya presence on the land was either ignored or invisible to the government. In a sense, this reminds us of terra nullism, the empty land kind of myth that was at the core of conquest and colonization. The taking possession of the land is sanitized by declaring that no one was on the land. The fact that my people are using the land for hunting and gathering, for planting their corn, this was totally ignored in the process of granting these concessions. So coloniality, as you can see, is alive. Thirdly, even when Maya land use is recognized, that takes second priority exploitation of resources to, to the exploitation of resources for the purposes of national development. That is, Maya rights and dreams are sacrificed at the altar of development. Fourthly, when the Maya people make it to court, the government claims, okay, you are indigenous, but not indigenous to Belize, which again resonates with the colonial anima nullius. You are not quite human. You're human, but not quite human. It's more, it appeals to the colonial dispossessive history to claim that in any case, whatever rights the Maya people had were extinguished to the colonial history to continue to dispossess contemporary Maya people. In struggling to defend their rights to land them, Maya people are engaging in the colonial act. They're engaging the persisting colonial leg uh, logic and matrix of power. But the struggle for land is not a simple struggle for a piece of real estate. In response to the question of why the emphasis on land, one of the leaders comments, because without land, we run the risk of being completely impoverished. And in another statement points out that land is important because here, this land is where I feel complete. I won't go hungry and I can be myself. In many ways then, it is a struggle for a Maya way of knowing, being, and doing for a space to define a Maya future. To illustrate how this is happening, I want to draw on the Maya initiative uh, to articulate a Maya vision of the future post the CCG court ruling. In 2018, the Maya leadership commissioned a process to articulate this vision, noting that they wanted a space outside of conventional development thinking for people to dream their future. To this end, a cross-section of the Maya communities were invited to participate and asked to respond to arts-based methods to three questions. Who are we as Maya people? Where are we? What is our reality? And what is the dream? What is our dream for the future? The initiative was called Towards a Dream for Our People and Our Land. I want to share with you some of the drawings that came out of that process. Here are two drawings that illustrate how Maya people see themselves. These two drawings here, one uh, done by women and the other uh, done by men, illustrate how Maya people live on the land. You know, you have Maya women there washing the river, planting a garden, caring for the chickens, making caldo, uh, weaving 
and hopefully resting in the hammock there in their little house as well. The Mayans also drew the land, they drew the hills, the sacred hills, the sultaka, which is also a space for other uh, uh, non-human uh, beings, for the animals. Uh, they illustrated how they live on the land. So this is who we are. They, they presented the land as a very productive, uh, rich, and they also kind of illustrate that they have knowledge of how to work this land to sustain themselves. So they saw themselves as productive, as hardworking, as possessing knowledge to move into the future. Here is a, another drawing, and the, the one on the, on the right uh, is, is, uh, was done by young people. And again, we can see that here in making this drawing, uh, young people choose to use women's traditional dress to illustrate that they have their own identity. And in a sense to illustrate also, they have a long history on this land by drawing a Maya temple with a path that leads from there to a contemporary Mayan house. The land is vibrant, it is productive. Uh, there is a bowl of caldo to illustrate that we can nourish and sustain ourselves. There is cacao there. So very importantly, notice that one of the things that the Mayan people were doing is to recover their sense of being outside of the colonial logic. Now to the right, uh, one group decided to draw not only how they saw themselves, but how others see them, and particularly how the Belizean state looks at them. So in this drawing, they drew somebody wearing the Belizean flag with a taut bubble. And in that bubble, uh, we'll see that there is somebody with a begging bowl. Uh, we can see an emaciated person, an emaciated dog, somebody on the ground with flies lying around uh, with a bottle on the side. So in a sense, in contrast to how we see ourselves as being hardworking, as possessing knowledge and people of strength uh, with our own culture, with our own history and ways of doing and being uh, on the land, uh, they're saying, this is how we are seen. And so again, we see that the colonial uh, logic is very much uh, present there. This is some of the drawings that uh, they drew about the future that they imagined. And I'm just going to focus on one of them. <clears throat> on the right was a drawing done by women. And it says there, we want to have a, a, a future, a good future gene. We want to have a home and land to work in order to grow our local food. So very important, it's not only to create produce for sale, but to grow our own local food. And there's an emphasis also on the locality of food. So we have our own foods and we want to grow that. We want children uh, and schools, you know, we want children to be safe in schools. Um, and they want uh, the best quality education for their children. They want playgrounds. They want uh, people to continue to working together and supporting each other, this notion of unity. One of the terms that the Maya people often used in uh, speaking about the dream that they had was this concept of kuna hill or komonil. And they often use uh, the building of a touch house to illustrate how they have an economy of reciprocity, that they have a way of sustaining themselves, of sharing their labor, uh, of doing things for themselves as a community. There are two more drawings here that I wanted to share, and I just wanted to point to one element of the first drawings uh, to the right. Here, and you see the term Kunakil, and just beside it, there are two people shaking hands. One of them is somebody with a jacket, a red jacket, and the next person uh, you can see has a bag hanging around their neck. If you've been to Toledo, you will recognize that that person is a Maya person, and really an alcalde, a Maya leader. And this man leader is shaking hands with somebody wearing a red suit, essentially representing the state and the government. We want a respectful relationship uh, with the state. We want the state to recognize that we have our own forms of organizing ourselves, our own leadership, and that they ought to be respected. And so we want uh, this respectful relationship. On the right, uh, there's a drawing that illustrates a happy family village. And it says peace and love. And what people drew here, this group drew uh, a house. 
uh, within that, there's a kitchen. In one corner of the kitchen, then there, there are books, and in the other, and other corner, there are natural herbs. There's medicine. Right? Uh, we see that there is a food storage uh, facility, but the food storage facility is not only a uh, refrigerator. We're actually a space where you're storing cassava, where you're storing sugar cane, uh, where you're storing corn, where, where you're storing all kinds of fruits and vegetables, the things that you need to uh, eat and to sustain yourself. There's a garden outside. Um, there's also a little bit at the top of the corner there, uh, they say it's guest house, rent. So there's also an economy that my people are aiming to create as part of this uh, future. Now, there are many things that we could say about you know, these drawings and we could spend a lot of time analyzing them. Um, but what is important uh, to emphasize, as I said, is that Maya people, in a sense, are rescuing their sense of self. They're rescuing their knowledge and rescuing a space for imagining a future that's outside of the colonial logic. Now, the goal and process of visioning the future is a decolonial act. Ultimately, the Maya people are engaged in a process of dreaming and crafting a decolonial future by engaging in a process of rerouting and rerouting. It aim, aims to recover a sense of self. It aims to recover being from the colonial logic, recover time. History does not start with Europeans. It goes way behind and it doesn't <clears throat> buy into European time. It attempts to recover space and ultimately to dream new ways about new ways of relating to the land and to each other by building on their long history and cultural wealth. In Dreaming the Future, the Maya participants drew on Maya concepts such as a bink, uh, such as ral uh, such as concepts as kunakil, which are indigenous concepts. Uh, ral means uh, people of the land, people who uh, live, depend, and care for the land. And so ultimately, moving into the future, what, it, what Maya people are attempting to do is to ask, what might Ral Church mean going forward? What does it mean to be indigenous going forward? And what, is, what will our life on the land be going forward? And I think in this way, uh, Maya people are engaged in an act of decolonization, of decolonial future making. And there are lessons to be drawn from that. I want to make one uh, last point. I started by pointing out that too often we tend to think of colonialism as a historical period that came to an end uh, of uh, independence. However, it is important to recognize that colonialism gave rise to a pattern of power that persists today. It continues to shape how we think about ourselves, how we relate to the land and to each other. As Maldonado points out, we continue to live and read coloniality today. The Maya people of Belize have been seeking to overcome this reality of coloniality by confronting the legacy of this possession and the coloniality of the state. <clears throat> They're engaging in a colonial process by seeking to see themselves outside of the colonial logic and seeking to define a future in which their relationship with each other and the land transcend that colonial logic and rather it's rooted in their indigeneity while open to other understandings from other cultural horizons. In this way, I think they point to some of the work that is yet to be done in terms of the colonizing independent Belize. In closing, however, let me point out that Belize as a nation state is the product of the colonial encounter, spatially and populationally. The boundaries of Belize are not natural. They are a European invention, the result of a quarrel between two empires over who gets to exploit land that belonged to someone else with the labor of someone else. Populationally, we did not decide to live together. We were rounded, pushed, contained, uh, or brought here for the purposes of exploitation. Our relationship to the land, our relationship with each other, our sense of self and our genes for the land, the people and the people who occupy this land was shaped and continues to be shaped in many ways by the colonial logic. The task at hand as I see it is, how do we imagine and craft a more inclusive, just, peaceful and caring Belize? This in my view is intimately connected to the question of decolonization. The kind of violence, the pattern of power instituted must be overcome. Having said that, no system of oppression is completely effective and monolithic. We held on to some of our own sense of self, to some of our own ways of relating to the land. 
were also able to establish relations with each other outside of the colonial logic. That is, we resisted, subverted, and invented. My sense, however, is that these ways are in the margins, perhaps dim, and we need to rescue them and build upon. Thank you. And I want to thank you so much, Dr. Filiberto Penalos, for that um, wonderful presentation. Of course, um, the, 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 the Mayans are an integral part of Belize. And my goal, of course, is for us to live as one people, one united Belizean people, looking out for each other, taking care of each other, and uh, doing our best to get rid of the colonial domination system, which is a mental uh, situation, and moving forward as a united people um, and moving our country forward. Let me move um, at this um, point in time to, to um, questions and answers. And we have been receiving quite a number of questions from those who are watching. And um, so I will give them the preferences against so me asking any questions at, at this time. Um, Danielle Marie says, on a practical level, what steps can or should expand the knowledge of Belize history and ultimately begin chiseling away the calcified thoughts of surrounding independence and decolonization? And um, she's saying an interested panelist, but maybe if Asina, you can, you can take that one. Yeah, I am looking at the at the question. So uh, please remind me which one it is. Question from Danielle Marie. On a practical mm -hmm. level, what steps mm -hmm. can or should expand the knowledge of Belize history and ultimately begin chiseling away the calcified thoughts of surrounding independence and decolonization? It, uh, I would say a relearning of our history. I think that um, it is imperative that at all levels of the education system, they, our history uh, is being taught or should be taught to, to our children. So I'm thinking even from the preschool level right, right up. Um, also, because the general population needs this re-education, it would require, of course, um, creativity on our part. And one of the things that we intend to do at the Belize History Association is to have more of these type of lives uh, on Facebook so that there's constant historical dialogue going on on the page that people have access to. That way, the general population would have access to that information. And the more people know, the more they have to share. If you don't know, you can't share anything. You can't influence your children. You can't change their thinking about history if you yourself don't have an understanding of history. So it is about educate a mass education campaign that is not just for those who are within the formal education system, but even for the general, general public. It, that's the challenge that we currently have. And um, it should be in terms of the content content that we develop for ourselves it's not not the content that that currently exists that is um, what was provided or that was written from the colonial standpoint but content that we ourselves have created because a, a lot of research has been done some writing has been done and more of that needs to be encouraged by us um, if I seen a, at, at what age do you think we should start educating um, on Belize's history and past and present from preschool i'm saying if you if you if parents know they can tell their children stories that's that's because in the past oral history was the way that history was passed on it was true parents telling their children elders telling their children that relationship between one generation and the other allowed for the sharing of stories of the past and values and, and whatever was important in terms of events was shared with the next generation in that way. So bridging the gap between the young and the old, that is something that we definitely need to consciously work on so that we can again have the elders bringing the story to the children and the children then really internalizing those stories, appreciating those stories so they too can share it to the next generation. That's a gap that we definitely have to fill right now. For sure. Thank you so much, Ifashina. Um, there's another question here from Yasmin Ayuso. What would you say are our next steps to becoming totally sovereign and potentially a world power player at some point? And if not our current political system, what would be an alternative system that could promote 
more equity and checks and balances into our branches of government? And that's a question for Jordan. Jordan? Hi, can you see me? Not yeah. Yet, but we will Hello? see you soon. Yes, see me? Okay, hi. Yeah. Um, th uh, that's an excellent question. Um, there are several parts to it. Um, if I may, I think I am, um, I will attempt to answer all of them, but I think I'm best equipped to uh, respond to the part about sovereignty. So what are the next steps to becoming totally sovereign? Um, one thing I would want to challenge everyone to do is to think about sovereignty in different terms. Sovereignty, I think, has been reduced to strictly the nation state and strictly the constitutional and judicial attributes of the nation state. So we are truly sovereign only when Belize and Belizeans make the choices that affect our lives. I want to challenge you all to think of sovereignty beyond those terms. And I think that given the way the world is so interconnected, that confining our understanding of sovereignty to the nation state is limiting. And so one thing, I, I am a student of the University of the West Indies. And so my thinking has been influenced by the Caribbean. And in my work at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I have seen how sovereignty has evolved beyond the understanding of the nation state. There is something in the Caribbean academic literature that is called shared sovereignty, and it has been used to describe the approach of the Caribbean community. Um, and it is something that Belize, the government of Belize, particularly the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but also the Ministry of Health and other ministries have implemented its shared sovereignty which refers to the ability of Belize to pick like partners or partners with the same interests to address substantive sovereignty issues, such as climate change, such as health, such as energy, such as economic dependency. So I point to the example of CARICOM because in us sharing our decision making with CARICOM, that is an exercise of sovereignty. Yeah. So it's not just the decision making being limited to the nation state of Belize and the institutions of the nation state of Belize, but we are sharing our sovereignty in a way that it affects our interests positively. And that is through the work of CARICOM. And that is through the work of other with other organization and partners that are to our benefit, such as the island, the Alliance of Small Island States, such as the Organization of African, Caribbean and Pacific States. So that is, I, I challenge you all to think of sovereignty beyond just Belize and Belizeans using our institutions to make decisions. It is also our collaborative work with like-minded partners but the challenges to our sovereignty that come, to that come with internationalization are when countries with different interests from ours yes. challenge us to make choices that are not in our interests. And that often happens with the Western countries that exert their influence and power over us and diminish our sovereignty. But I just, I just want to clarify that sovereignty is not necessarily giving up control to countries that are not Belize. Uh, sovereignty within the scope of CARICOM and with the scope of like-minded international partners, it works in our favor. And so that is, an, I, that is a concept known as shared sovereignty. So I, in, in, in terms of how would Belize become more sovereign, um, in fixing our institutions that accommodate these organizations better, so like I know, for example, the Ministry of Health is in direct communications with the Caribbean and Public Health Regional Authority. And CARFA helps the Ministry of Health make its choices and decisions and its actions. That is a way of um, use, um, 
or making our institutions fit that shared sovereignty concept. So th that is one way of be making us more sovereign is by us opening ourselves to like-minded partners like CARICOM and the small island states to properly address issues that affect us because issues that affect us will never be able to be fully addressed by ourselves. All of our developmental and security problems are interconnected with the world. We will always need to have an international approach to solve our developmental and security challenges. And so this idea of shared sovereignty is something that I think is powerful for Belize to take a grip on and really embrace. And likewise, to make it work, those organizations like CARICOM need to have the frameworks and institutions in place to make, to accommodate the nation states and make it so they both can work together without there being any sort of infringing on national sovereignty. And then now to the part about the political system. Um, well, certainly I am of the personal belief that we need a head of state that is Belizean um, or someone that comes from our society, our community and an office, a political office of head of state that is a Belizean office, not a foreign monarch. So that would entail some, some sort of form of republicanism that works yeah. for Belizeans. But I, 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 I'm sorry to say, but I'm not ready to ascribe any sort of specific attributes to what that sort of republicanism would look like. I would just hope that as many Belizeans are involved in determining that as possible. Um, but I would certainly say that at least for the executive and legislative branches, um, they need to be separated from what our arrangement is now, the entire executive branch is composed of half of the legislative branch. And I think that there is a sincere conflict of interest when you have a minister of a ministry that has to serve his constituents and exercise the executive authority of the ministry. I think that that is where you, you see clientelism happen and patronage happen when mm -hmm the resources of the executive authority are used in a legislative sense to meet the needs and interests of the constituents. Um, I don't mean to point to the United States as some exemplary example, but their executive branch, their cabinet, is not composed of people from the US Congress. That is a the executive branch is separate from the legislative branch. And I would say that if as, a, as my personal opinion is that any political system that we entertain in the future needs to see a separation of those two branches. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much because ideally the, the, the political system is set up as the legislative, the executive, and the, the representation of the people. Right? Yes. Right. Thank you so much. Um, John Jasmine says, um, what are the remains of Belize's colonial past that are still affecting the present? And um, any of you can take that question. What are the remains of Belize's colonial past that are still affecting the present? I don't Anybody know if anyone want? wants to take that. <laughs> well, like I, I, yeah, West <laughs> I was going to just ar ag agree with what Jordan had just said about uh -huh. the fact that uh, we have a head of state that is a monarch. For example, I mean, you just look at our currency and you don't see us on our currency. Um, well, you can see in the background elements of Belize in, on our currency, but what you see on the floor is the, is the monarch. And so that is one of the things that we've held on to. The religious system, the structure that we have in place, our system of government, plus the religious system, the, this whole church state arrangement that we have, is also one that we've inherited and that we have held on to that continues to poison our minds really because you have just this component of our society that takes control of our minds once we enter the education system. It's not just a voluntary thing. It is once you go to school, you then have to subscribe to whatever it is that is being taught to you in the school system and you're there for what, eight years at least. So there, they, those are some of the key fundamental uh, aspects of colon, colonization that m remain with us that we need to consciously deconstruct. The church state system has got to go. 
because it has it, it, it has really maintained that indoctrination, that programming, and there can be no liberation if people's minds are still being controlled in that way by the religion of the colonizer, no matter what version of the religion, by the way, because there are many versions of it. It's the same religion. It's the same religion that they impose on us, which is Christian, that we now com we subscribe to, but it is based on what they brought to us, what they imposed on us from long, long ago. And on the political side of, of, of things, would, we, would it be correct to say that we have replaced um, the colonial master with a form of mental colonization brought on by ourselves? Would it be fair to say something like that? Brought on by ourselves, not necessarily, but maintained by ourselves. Maintained by ourselves. Maintained by ourselves. Not brought on, but maintained. We haven't consciously challenged that in any way. And even as uh, I, when I teach of history and I teach of what uh, the public meeting was comprised of and the fact that it was made up of these ex-pirates, you know, uneducated men, ex-pirates, thieves, vagabonds, you know, they were the criminals, but then they became also the decision makers. They became the ones that were, they had political power and they had economic power. And even when the colonial authority came, the representative being the superintendent, being a military person with training, they were so, I mean, they had major challenges dealing with these settlers who were uneducated, but were the ones in power making the decisions. And when we look at how our government is comp composed, you still end up having People, when you watch their characters, the things they do, the decisions that they make, it's dom dominated by men who end up with economic power, and they're the ones making the decisions on all of our behalves without even necessarily consulting with us. Many of them still behaving like pirates too. So yeah. if we watch that history, it, it's still repeating itself. We haven't done anything, put structures in place to ensure that, for example, corruption does not and cannot happen. And that is one of the things we have to constantly be working on because we're depending on these same people to put the checks and balances in place. Of course, they're not going to do that. They won't check and balance themselves, right? Can I, um... okay. Can I... This question is for Delmar Sib and it's from Melissa Espat. And Melissa is saying, I find that our education system has been adapting to international systems. To what extent do we use a copy and paste system in the classroom? How do you suggest we transform our system so that we can decolonize education? That's for Delmar. <coughs> um, I think the question has two, two um, dimensions to it. Um, I, will, I will first speak about the, the, the second aspect of it. How do we decolonize the education system? And I think that one of the fundamental things about education itself is the fact that the, the colonial system has successfully ingrained in us that education is only housed within an institution or is only housed within a classroom. And if you think about it, even today as we speak about um, technical schools or, or schools that teach traits, in our minds or in minds of many Belizeans, that is a lesser level of education or, or, it, or it is denigrated to an extent because of this particular mentality that has been ingrained in us. So one of the things that we need to do is actually to, to broaden the definition of what education means. Because in indigenous forms of education, um, talking, as Ifasina mentioned earlier, um, oral accounts, sharing stories, and, and, and um, teaching children certain skills and all of these things, that was all part of education as a whole. So when we talk about changing the education system, we also need to look at that particular aspect where we're teaching, but not only teaching to think, but also teaching to say, hey, education is not only housed within this classroom. The second aspect to it is that we need to also give respect to indigenous knowledge. Now, um, I know that some institutions are, are, are trying to put in some sort of indigenous knowledge within the curriculum, but even that, if you look at it from, a, from an objective standpoint, the indigenous knowledge that is being incorporated is not necessarily given the same value as the other Western knowledge that is being incorporated. For example, um, the, I, I know of schools that try to teach the Maya language within the classroom, but that's just one, one session that they teach the Maya language. Mm -hmm. Yet all of the other languages or, or all of the other classes are given in the English language. So you see, there is not the same value given to both um, ideas or to both languages. So the last aspect to this particular question 
is the fact that the system of teaching itself within the classroom also needs to change. And I think I, I mentioned Paulo Freire, where um, what he's talking about is a liberation of the mind and a, and, a, and a sort of liberation or liberated culture within the classroom, where the student feels as valuable and as respected as a teacher. And the teacher, instead of simply dominating, helps the student to gain knowledge and open his mind towards action. And I think that is a very important element that we need to look at. And I think our first question was about us copying some of the um, strategies that are used elsewhere. Okay, I'm and I, 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 I agree to that. Um, we have been copying a lot, um, a lot of the strategies that are coming around. And I think that's part of the problem, actually. Because if, if, if we keep just simply ascribing to everything that is done outside and just copying what we have, or copying and, and bringing it into what we have, we're going to continue replicating these systems of Eurocentric values because obviously they're foreign. Um, just to give you an example, I always tend to talk, well, actually I was, I was, I was speaking to someone earlier and I was telling, uh, uh, telling them about looking at group activities, for example, where in indigenous settings, communal activities is something that we do together so that you sort of um, be more efficient in carrying out whatever project. Yet when you do community projects or, or sorry, group learning in the classroom, Many of the students already come with the mentality, oh, group, that means it's less work, that means um, it's going to be less demanding, and that means it's going to be easier. That is part of the colonial framework. Why? Because that's something that was imposed by the colonizer, whereby it's supposed to be individual, it's supposed to be based or geared towards a, a test, not a project. It shouldn't be a communal thing, it should be an individual thing, and it's a competition. All of these aspects are problems that are facing in the education system, but I agree. It's, it's a long journey, but it's not only a, a journey of the system, it's also a journey of the self. And as a teacher, I need to examine what I'm doing and what I'm saying and how I'm carrying it out, because that's all, or that's all intensifying or breaking the system. We have an, a question here from <coughs> Dr. Penados. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a question for Dr. Penados. It says, when it comes to the land rights, would you agree that the Yucatec Maya of the North has suffered for the process of colonization compared to those of the Maya of the South. And that came from Batab Maskab Maswewal. Um, thank you for the question. Um, I don't know whether I can answer the question, whether they have suffered an additional colonization. Um, certainly, I think we see in, in the sense that uh, the, the Yucatec Maya have been they have experienced more forces of assimilation uh, perhaps than the case of Toledo. In other words, the fact that uh, the Kekchi and Mopan were marginalized and isolated for some time in a sense in the end perhaps worked to some degree of, uh, of advantage. In other words, the presence of the state uh, perhaps is weaker there. And people, people like Joel Wainwright have written about that in the presence of the state in, in Toledo. Uh, so, perhaps the fact that that weakness of the state's presence there allowed for the Kekchi people to hold on to their own ways of organizing, their own ways of working the land, their language, and so on. Uh, so there's perhaps been kind of a, a lesser of a penetration, I, I, would, I would say. Um, I think that would be my answer. I did want to kind of um, say something. I think there was a question about kind of what remains uh, of uh, coloniality, of colonialism. And uh, I noticed there was a question also about the case of Barbados or replacing the head of uh, state. I think the symbolic part is important. It's important to change those symbols. But I think we have to be careful that it would not stay at the symbolic level. In other words, if colonialism is basically one, racism and a pattern of exploitation, to what extent does that continue to exist today? Who are the people that are being exploited? How does that exploitation happen? In what ways do res those resources continue to exist today? To me, those two things we really, really need to address. Uh, the fact that, for example, the Maya people in Toledo and Southside Billy City are among the poorest. What does that tell us? How, what does that have to do with colonialism? I think those are some questions that we need to uh, be asking. As I said, how do we rescue both the land and labor from the colonial logic? Okay, another question here um, for any of the panelists. It says, 
as Belizeans and knowing that we are an independent country, besides looking deeply into the self to free our minds, what is the role of suggest or the suggested role of the government? And this is for any panelist who would like to um, pick up on it. What is the suggested role of the government with regards to looking to ourselves and freeing our minds? Any of you? Um, I, I, I guess I'm on screen here. So what is the role of the, of the government? Um, <laughs> I, I think if you think about the government as sort of the manager of land and people, in other words, the territory and people, okay? Um, ultimately, it needs to facilitate uh, this multiple voices that make up beliefs, okay? Uh, bring us together, facilitate a process in which we can come together and dream a future, okay, that is rooted in our heritage. I don't know to what extent, for example, uh, African, uh, Karinago, Maya knowledge, values, and so on, and really inform uh, the Belizean dream and future making. I have to say that I don't see it, okay, I, mm -hmm. I don't see it. I think even though you have gained independence, the state apparatus continues to be essentially uh, informed by, Europe, by European logic. Uh, could reach, reach out into this, this wealth of knowledge to try to recreate and reinvent uh, and invent a new way of governing ourselves. I want to say also that um, I think the, the people that make up the government also need the education. We assume many times that people who take up political leadership know the country, know the history of the country. We assume so much about them because we do not actively participate in even their selection. We depend on the political parties to present to us the potential leaders. We are not actively participating as citizens in even the selection of the people that we choose as leaders. So of course, when the decisions are being made sitting at the cabinet table and in the House of Representatives, they're not necessarily being made in the best interest of the nation because you don't even know if in the heart of those individuals that are in political leadership, Belize is at the fore. It, it always has appeared, no matter which one of the parties are in power, that the, it's the self-interest and the interest of the party that dominates rather than the interests of the nation. So this relearning is not just for the general population. It is also for the people in political leadership. And we can only hope and we can only insist that they too are getting the information, getting the education, and decolonizing. Because what they are guilty of is simply replacing the colonizer. And this is not only in the case of Belize. This is, this is what has happened in many other countries, is that our same people who are the nationalists who wanted to, to get rid of colonization simply replaced the colonizer. They didn't come with anything new. They were just the colonizer in Belizean form. Okay, and, and um, thank you so much, Ifashina. And this is the last question here because of time. And it comes from Joel Wainwright. Um, it says, my, and I just read it, my question concerns a sub-theme of each of these presentations. As each of you noted colonialism or, or the making of modern beliefs was a process driven by the accumulation of capital in a global capitalist economy. Does it follow that the struggle for decolonization equals a struggle against capitalism? How should we understand the relation between these struggles to decolonize and to overcome capitalism in Belize? And any panelist can take that. And that is our final question because of time. Um, again, let me, let me attempt to answer the question. I think in, in my mission of uh, coloniality and the pattern of domination that emerged in colonialism is essentially capitalist. It is a capitalist exploitative system. And so decolonization ultimately has to confront that. Um, and we have to be able to see that we, this different movements that might be existing in Belize are ultimately tackling that. I think we, we, we have to, it, it absolutely comes down to that. So I see one, the question of racism and capitalism as two of the critical issues that we need to address, okay? If you think about what it is that the Maya people are doing, 
essentially they're, they're trying to overcome the racism, say, look, we have our own way of understanding ourselves, our own ways of being on the land. That is important. We have our own knowledge. We have an identity. But also trying to say, what is going to be our relationship with each other in terms of economically and politically? How are we going to relate with the land? It is about finding an alternative that goes beyond capitalism. Okay? Um, and that doesn't mean necessarily that it has to be communism or something else, but we have to invent, we have to reach into our cultural heritage to imagine alternative futures. And that's why I talk a lot about, about decolonial future making, okay, of making space for that, of imagining a future that goes beyond the colonial. Sorry. Um, I, I will sneak in a, a, last, a last question here, and, uh, and this one says, how much has the political divide contributed to us not teaching our own Belizean history in the way we should? Anyone can take that. The political divide is a, it's like a cancer that's destroying uh, our nation um, because because it, it causes people to have a limited vision that is blue or red there's just two colors it's it's blue or red and it's it's um you're just fanatically supporting it, it doesn't matter if anything was done wrong it doesn't matter it's just you're going with the with this and so even if something great comes up under one administration if there is a, an excellent idea and an, an excellent initiative that is put in place because of that same political divide, then when a new party comes into power, they, then they don't continue it, they, they undermine it, or they try to come with something new. And it just keeps setting us back steps and steps and step back because of that same uh, division in our in our thinking and if we're going to decolonize indeed and if we're going to have a future that is progressive in this country we would have to step away from that divide and truly analyze how it has destroyed us how it has truly kept us back as a nation because we can't can't move you know you, the dog has four feet but can only travel one road that's a yoruba proverb we can't go blue and red direction you know it's we have to have a common vision as a nation and operate on that vision as a nation moving forward together divided that's the colonial that's how the colonists colonizers had uh, dominance over us they divided and conquered us and we need to change that Thank you so much, Yifashina. I'm, I'm not sure if anybody would like to, to jump in on that, but uh, because, because of time, maybe if you want to do so, you make your intervention very, very short. If I don't hear from you, I'm assuming that you're okay. Yeah. Well, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think um, Yifashina made a very important point. Um, it all has to do with policies, and but also it, it doesn't only have to do with policies, but the education system itself. Um, when a government shifts, you, you see changes in the education system that directly impact not only what is being taught in the classroom, but um, how it's being taught as well. The policies shift, um, what is required from teachers shifts. And um, I think that is very important. But what is also important is, um, do the political parties have a clear agenda? Do they really want to decolonize? What is the agenda of the UDP? What is the agenda of the PUP? What sort of philosophy are they bringing forward? Um, what education do they want to bring forward? What are they defending? And I think that these questions are very important to see what exactly or how exactly this political divide has been impacting the reality on the ground. But even so, I think both political parties do not have a clear agenda politically, uh, at least in terms of philosophical inclination. So that sort of um, wavy philosophy that they have simmers down into the education system and directly impacts our any movement towards decolonization. Thank you, thank you so much. Anyone else? And before I say my thank yous to you panelists for being so fantastic and, and for being so candid um, with us. Any, 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 anything else from any one of you? Having 
Well, I just want to, I want to say, um, I'm hoping, I mean, we've had so many listeners and so many viewers and this, um, process is not going to stop with this one event. It is, it is a conscious effort. If you're going to decolonize, if you're going to liberate your mind, it is a conscious effort and a constant, we have to be constantly assessing because it's deep rooted. They, I mean, they started from very young pushing this into us and it came from generation to generation to generation and it's still being maintained in some of the things that we see on TV, the things we, we're hearing. And so it is a conscious effort we have to be making to undo and unlearn the lies that we've been told, change our language, change our thinking, Maya sites, Maya archaeological sites, their ancient cities, not ruins. You know, mm -hmm. Columbus got lost. Columbus did not discover. He couldn't discover because people were already here and civilized. You understand? Like, we have to unlearn the lies we've been told and start to speak those truths. Mayas are Mayas. They're not Indians. Indians mm -hmm. come from India. So Indians are not East Indians because India is in the East and it remains there. You understand? Like we have to undo, unlearn all the lies and start to speak, it, speak those truths and speak those truths consistently every time, all the time. We're one race, we're a human race. The race that we have is diverse and we have to figure out because all of us contributed to creating it, how we can move forward independently together. That's, we need to work on that together as a nation. And we're one people, the Belizean people. Uh, thank you so much, um, panelists. We want to thank Ifashina Efunemi, Jordan Craig, Delmar Zeeb, and Filberto Penados for being our panelists today. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to thank um, Niche and uh, the Belize Historical Society for having me being a part of this. And uh, let's um, continue the process of talking Belize. So thank you so much. And um, I don't know, um, we, Rolando, all the best. And I guess you, you'll end here. Thank you, uh, Dr. René Villanueva, for being our host. Thank you for thanking our presenters. They did an excellent job. The presentations were well-researched and candidly delivered. We really appreciate, as well, all the questions that came in over the Zoom platform, over the Facebook platform and thank you for all the radio listeners and thank you to Love FM and Love Television for broadcasting this event. It certainly is an uh, honor to be able to speak to such a diverse audience during what is a very difficult time for the country and for the world. A difficult time um, no doubt created um, due to the pressures that uh, the environment is currently undertaking. And we know that significant threats are ahead of us in terms of climate change, um, in terms of uh, new technological disruptions that will change the way we work and change the way that we live. And these are all challenges that we will have to unite um, to be able to address. I want to also signal that we will have to develop some type of uh, medium to address all the other questions that we were not able to pose to the yeah. panelists today. Um, we will have to develop another, uh, perhaps a series of discussions or at least a, a statements from the panelists towards some of those questions that were posed, very intriguing questions, but due to time, we are not able to answer them today. Thank you so much to all our listeners, to all our viewers, to all our attendees. Please leave your final impression in the comments. We'd love to know how this um, lecture impacted you, what you think should happen next, um, who you think um, we should be inviting for a subsequent series. We are always interested to know um, about our fellow citizens and researchers who are interested to share their findings with the larger public. Thank you so much for joining the seventh edition of the Belize September lecture.